Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, CMAR Journal Club. We're probably having uh, going to have a smaller crowd today. I'm here in Montreal, and uh, in Montreal also happens um, to be the, the this year's venue of the uh, annual meeting of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, or ISMRM. So they are meeting here at the convention center, not to, center not too far from here. Um, and I know that many uh, many are there. And uh, if you already told me that we will not, not be able to make it uh, this time uh, because of that event. But nevertheless, um, we have a, a very interesting topic today. And we have two very interesting papers uh, that uh, look at this topic. And I'm very thankful for uh, Marcus Henningsen um, from uh, Linköping. Uh, and also, uh, he was also, I think, during this the time of this study at the King's College in London uh, to get started with the first uh, paper while we are um, we will discuss uh, the second paper and uh, see that Jerome Yearly also is already online uh, discuss the paper thereafter. So topic today is coronary angiography and uh, by MR and that is um, uh, let's say that has been around for a while. In fact, I think re I remember it was in 1993, something really bad happens to cardiac MR. There was a paper published, published in the New England Journal saying um, CMR coronary angiography is here. But I think the expectations that were raised at that time, they were just too high. And then there was also this notion among cardiologists, yeah, once CMR can do the coronaries, then everything will be fine, which is, of course, a fairly childish view of uh, what you need in cardiology and also uh, uh, ne neglecting basically all the other uh, important in information that we can gather from a CMR scan. Coronary angiography is definitely not one of the, let's say, the, the tools we need of in, in every patient for diagnostic decision making. On the other hand, it is important for uh, many uh, when it comes to not only risk stratification, but also uh, looking at the coronary anatomy in preparation of uh, surgery in congenital heart disease. And so these two papers <clears throat> I found very interesting. One is on uh, two different approaches in pediatric uh, coronary MRI, where I think it's particularly important because we have to avoid radiation. Uh, uh, so uh, however we can. And the other paper will be on a comparison between CT and MR in identifying changes of small diameter. So with that uh, said, I will hand over to Marcus uh, presenting his paper published in the Journal of, for Cardi of, Journal of Cardiovascular MR uh, this year, and it's called Visualization of Coronary Arteries in Pediatric Patients Using Whole Heart Coronary MRA, Comparison of Image Navigation and the Standard Approach for Respiratory Motion Compensation. Marcus. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, the main <clears throat> sort of uh, point of this uh, paper was to compare a new uh, motion correction technique using image navigation in a head to head with a sort of standard uh, motion compensation technique in patients with uh, congenital heart disease. So I suppose the first thing to do is to dis define or describe what the standard method for uh, motion correction is and in coronary imaging, and that is using the diaphragmatic navigator, which I um, think probably most of you are aware of. Um, but just to briefly summarize, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's a way to track the uh, foothead motion of the lung liver interface and um, <clears throat> This is sort of interleaved with a 3D uh, segmented whole heart scan. And you can use this navigator information uh, in two ways. So the first one is to uh, basically gate the scan to end expiration, typically using some um, uh, predefined uh, gating window. And the second thing you can do as well is to um, use this um, the, the measured motion to track or update the field of view and this is called slice tracking uh, commonly. Um, however, because you measure the motion on the diaphragm, you need some motion model to translate that to the heart. And the, the standard way is to assume a, a, a linear relationship of 0 0.6. So <clears throat> effectively, the, the standard technique is, is what we refer to as DNAV here. And we use it for both gating and uh, this uh, uh, tracking. 
and um, in our uh, center, the um, this this uh, gating window uh, depends a little bit on the the weight of the of the patient. So when we scan congenital heart disease, if there are uh, very small children, less than uh, 20 kilos, we use a, a gating window of three millimeters. If it's uh, between 20 and 40 kilos, then we use five. And if it's more than uh, 40, then we use a, a seven millimeter uh, gating. So this is the DNAV um, uh, technique or standard technique, um, um, which we have uh, used here. Um, so the image uh, navigator has been under development for uh, quite a few years now. It was initially published in, in I think 2011. And I will, just to explain the method, briefly refer to that, uh, to, to some previous papers. And the general approach here is that if we use um, a 3D SSFP uh, acquisition, we typically have a number of these uh, startup echoes, uh, approximately 10 or so. Uh, normally, you only use them to get into a, a sort of a, a steady state, but you can also kind of recycle these uh, startup echoes and use them to uh, generate a, a 2D image. And if I just quickly jump to that paper, what you can see here is the, the pulse sequence. And if we add phase encoding gradients to these startup echoes, um, if you just have one, well, you just have a projection, but if with only 10, well, if you have 10 startup echoes, you get a 10 lines of case space basically. And, and it gives you a, a low resolution image, which is good enough to, um, extract respiratory motion from. Um, the only, I, I suppose, um, concession here is that the, um, the um, image navigator uh, has to be, or is intrinsically aligned with the uh, orientation of the SSFP. So if you want to capture the motion, the main motion direction, which is in foothead, uh, our SSFP acquisition has to be either coronal or sagittal with a readout in, in the foothead. And typically we use a coronal orientation because we get a, a nice delineation of the heart as you can see here. And now I'm gonna briefly jump to an, another paper from 2015 where we also use this approach, but it sort of illustrates how we, we do the planning with this image navigator. So I hope you can see that here, but the red box shows the, um, the planning of the the image navigator and the, the uh, whole heart uh, SSFP. Um, and you can, if you have a coronal orientation, you can sort of exclude the chest wall. And um, um, the, another thing that we've, we've done here is to uh, try to extract this um, um, motion uh, in a sort of automatic way. And what we want to do is really only track the motion of the heart so to do that um, on the scanner in line, we've sort of recycled the shim geometry. So if we assume that the, the shim is, is on the thing that we're interested in, in the heart in this case, then we, we sort of use that to define our um, region of interest that we're tracking. So to, to illustrate that, I thought I would just show you a couple of actual images. So this is the uh, the cropped um, region of interest uh, on the heart uh, based on the shim geometry. And this is basically what the user sees in real time during the scan. So this is the real time image navigator. And to also illustrate the registration here, we, we show this sort of crosshairs, which is the result of a, a 2D registration. So the user sees sort of in real time what the actual motion of the heart is uh, as, as the scan happens. And, and another nice thing I should add about this is that you can also see if there's any uh, aliasing. So if you have any uh, bad uh, uh, wrapping into your field of view, you can also see that in, your, in these images. Anyways, um, this is sort of how the correction works. And we apply this directly to the, the case base of our 3D SSFP, which has exactly the same uh, geometry uh, or orientation as our uh, image navigator. So uh, it also has this uh, coronal orientation as you can see here. Okay, so that was the correction and the planning. Um, the, uh, so there's a second uh, aspect to this image navigator, um, which is the gating. 
And we do need to throw away some of the worst data because we use a Cartesian trajectory, which is quite sensitive to, to motion, um, although it gives us good SNR and CNR. Um, so what we do, we've implemented here is, is a um, gating method called CRUISE. Basically what it does is that we acquire twice as much data as we need, and then we only keep the, the, the best 50% uh, or the most end expiratory 50% of the data. So this published in MRM uh, one or two years ago. Um, if you're interested in it, you can, can look at this reference, but uh, effectively that's, that's how it works. So in this paper, we've used the image navigator as I just described it with this 2D translational correction and this cruise gating. So that's our technique. Um, and then, so we compare this head to head to the standard diaphragmatic navigator in uh, 40 patients with congenital heart disease. We looked at a couple of different um, um, uh, image quality metrics. Uh, we looked at uh, qualitative, um, uh, we did a qualitative comparison uh, where we graded the images from uh, one to five. So one is, is uh, poor image quality and, and five is, is excellent image quality. Um, we also did a, a coronary um, sharpness measurement, which we often do in these, these uh, types of studies, which uh, basically tells you how, how sharp the coronary arteries are in a sort of um, a quantitative uh, way. And we also looked at the um, ability to uh, visualize the uh, origins and the proximal course of the coronary arteries. Obviously, in these uh, congenital patients, you're often very interested to see if there are any uh, anomalous coronaries. And, and, and so that was one of the important uh, comparisons as well. Uh, and then we also looked at the, the length of the, the coronary arteries. So let's jump to the results. As I said, we scanned 40 patients, uh, and, and this is quite a sort of heterogeneous uh, population, I suppose. Uh, they range from three months to 17 years. Uh, if you're interested in the specifics, I, I think the table one summarizes all the, the different di diagnostics that, that, we, that we had. And, and I think there's an even more elaborate uh, breakdown in, in the supplementary material. Um, and so um, another thing also is that some of these patients had, uh, um, some of them were uh, scanned uh, under general an anesthesia, uh, about, uh, 15 out of the 40, uh, 25 were scanned uh, awake. And uh, also in 22 cases, we used um, uh, gadolinium. And then and, and the other 18 were scanned without any gadolinium. Um, so also, of course, we looked at the scan time uh, between these two um, uh, uh, techniques. That's, of course, another important consideration. Um, I just jumped to that comparison here. Um, <clears throat> so when we uh, looked at just the patients in, in under GA, so they were anesthetized, uh, usually they breathe very nicely and regularly. Um, we didn't see any difference between our image navigator and our uh, the standard technique, which is the DNAV here. So every line here is a, a, a patient. Uh, and <clears throat> basically with in this uh, scenario, uh, usually you always get around a 50% efficiency with the standard technique and, and with our image navigator, we obviously assume 50%, so it's more or less the same. Uh, the more interesting comparison is, is when we look at the awake patients, where with the standard technique, you have a, a much larger spread of values. So that reflects the fact that we have a large differences in our gating efficiency. Uh, and some of the worst cases, um, it was even more than 15 minutes of scanning. Um, whereas with image navigator, the, the distribution is, uh, is much more narrow. So the scan time become, is more predictable. And if you take the average as well and compare, then the average scan time with the image navigator was also significantly shorter than for the standard technique um, for the awake patients. And if we go to back to the image quality, um, in um, 39 out of the 40 cases, the, the qualitative image 
scoring, so the, from one to, to five, um, was uh, the same or better using the image navigator compared to the, to the standard technique. Uh, this figure here just shows the distribution of, of the scoring. So we didn't have anyone with a, with a, a score of one. So every, every, all the data was either between two and five. But what you see here is that um, the, with the image navigator, you have a, a more a, a higher uh, distribution for the, the, the higher scores, basically. Uh, when you look at the, the best image quality score, we had almost 60% of the cases uh, there with the um, image navigator. Um, then if we, we look at the um, visual sharpness, so that's the sharpness of the coronary arteries, we sort of um, subdivided the data into um, one anal analysis where we compared uh, non-contrast versus contrast enhanced, and it's this this um, graph here. So in the lightly colored bars is the the, the, the cases without contrast, and the, the darker colors are the one, um, uh, sorry, the, the lightly ones are with contrast, the darker ones are without contrast. And what we see here is that only for the LAD do we have a significant uh, difference in, in sharpness for the, for the in the comparison of, of non-contrast. Um, obviously, all these are Bonferroni corrected, so that, that uh, sort of lowers our, uh, or increases the threshold for significance. Um, when we compare the, uh, so when we did a similar analysis with um, anesthesia or um, uh, general anesthesia and, and awake patients, um, we see seen actually for and, and the lightly colored are uh, the GA ones, the uh, awake, the dark ones are the awake cases. Uh, we see for all uh, three coronaries, RCA, LAD, and circumflex, a uh, significant difference uh, in favor of the image navigator. Um, so let me see, I think uh, the only final thing I should say here in the results is that um, when we looked at the ability to visualize the origins and proximal course of the coronaries in 84% in, in of the cases, we could see that uh, we, we could see those with the INAV for all three coronaries, but only in 63% of the cases using the uh, diaphragmatic navigator. So um, I think that's, those are the main findings. Um, I should... Um, perhaps say some of the limitations uh, we, we could we would have wished for for more patients obviously to improve our statistical um, power uh, and obviously you can question uh, if this is truly the the standard technique in all centers specifically using uh, variable um, gating windows but uh, anyways th these this is how we we it's done in, in King's College um, so in conclusion the image navigator um, gives you better image quality in a shorter scan time, particularly for uh, in awake uh, patients. I think that's the, the main finding. Thank you very much for the fantastic presentation, especially uh, recently providing some additional images for a better understanding. We're already pretty advanced in our time. We have only 12 minutes left for the other paper. So uh, if someone has a question, please type it in the chat. Um, and uh, um, so we will try to address some questions later. But without further ado, I want to uh, hand over to Jérôme. Jérôme, can you, uh, Mar uh, uh, Marcus, can you unshare your screen? And then I would ask Jérôme to share your screen uh, to, to present your paper. Okay, I can um, do that. Can you hear me first? Yeah, so welcome, uh, Jerome Yelly. Uh, he's working in Matthias Stuber's group, and uh, Jerome does a couple of fantastic things and is working on several projects. And uh, this one uh, is, I don't know whether it's even in the center of your interest, but it was about comparing CT and CMR for coronary angiography in a, in, a, in a phantom. So, Jerome, go ahead. Right. Um, so, I'm trying to share my screen. Can you see anything? My Not yet. Okay, my computer just froze, so let me see. Um, there, there is a sometimes there are two windows. Yes. And uh, yeah, now it's now it's working. Okay. Uh, now it's it it sees it looks here it has started screen. Now we can see your screen. Yeah. That's okay, great. that's perfect. Awesome. Well, um, thank you, Matthias, for the invitation. So I'm very glad that uh, you gave me that opportunity to discuss our uh, latest paper that we published in JCMR. So as you said in that paper, we were interested basically um, to compare 
uh, uh, CT versus MRI in order to measure uh, the diameter of, uh, of coronary arteries. So the reason why we do that, it's mainly because um, we are using, we are currently trying to use MRI to assess what we call the endothelial function. Uh, one night, um, so the endothelial function basically is just the ability of the coronary artery to dilate, uh, to, yeah, to dilate. Uh, and basically what we want to, to, to measure is uh, we want to stress basically the patients and then we want to uh, measure the response uh, of the coronary artery. And for that, so we need a very precise um, um, imaging uh, process. Um, so we've been doing that with MR for a couple of years now and we were getting uh, relatively good results. And uh, we decided at some point uh, to compare it with CT because we were expecting that CT would probably outperform MRI. But as you will see uh, by the end of my presentation, basically, uh, this was not the case, and we are actually quite surprised about those results. Um, so let's start first, um, um, again, with the introduction. So um, again, uh, coronary endothelial function basically uh, offers a fundamental uh, window into the, the, the progression disease of a coronary, uh, the coronary artery disease progression. Um, and basically, um, we... Um, we, have, we wanted not to use uh, we, the use of cardiac uh, CMR was already demonstrated by Matthias uh, Stuber back uh, in uh, Johns Hopkins University, where basically they use a, a, an isometric hand grip in order to stress the, uh, the, the subjects. So they were basically acquiring data um, first at rest, then they were using this data to measure the, the, the coronary artery, the diameter of the coronary artery, and then they were stressing these patients with the hand grip. Uh, and then they were measuring again the diameter and basically uh, quantifying the vasodilation of this coronary artery uh, gives us a measure of the endothelial function. Um, so this is just um, a, a general introduction. So now the goal of this study, of this specific study, again, was to uh, basically uh, optimize a CT protocol because a CT has never been used uh, before to measure the endothelial function. So uh, first we had to find the best parameters to measure the endothelial function. And then we used this optimized CT protocol and we compared it with um, our validated MRI protocol. So for that, we basically build a phantom. So let's maybe move to the image right away. Um, this phantom uh, was made of uh, what we call PMMA. So it's a polymethyl uh, metacrylate. Uh, this phantom uh, basically was, um, we, we drilled uh, holes of different diameter in that phantom, as you can see here. And we simulated basically 22 different diameters that ranged uh, between three and 3.42 millimeters, which represent uh, some uh, cross, uh, cross, uh, cross sectional area uh, from zero to about 30%. So to give you an order of magnitude, um, the, the, the response uh, of a healthy subject is in the order of 15 to 20%. So we, we usually expect a, a, 20, a 15 to 20% dilation uh, as a response in healthy coronaries. While in subjects with uh, artery disease, we will have uh, a decreased uh, dilation and sometimes we even have a paradoxical vasoconstriction. So meaning that instead of having a vasodilation, we will see a vasoconstriction. So um, basically with these diameters that we simulated, we, we, we cover the range of, of uh, physiological response. Uh, then for the CT acquisition, this, this phantom was then inserted into uh, 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 anthropomorphic thorax um, uh, phantom, which is uh, used for the CT acquisition in order to simulate basically the thorax of the of the patient. Um, <coughs> then maybe I just want to move uh, quickly. Uh, yeah. So here, so for the for the optimization of the CT protocol, uh, we basically looked at different tube potential um, because in general, I mean, the the thicker the patient, the higher the tube potential, but uh, we will have as well more noise. So um, basically, it would be better to use lower tube potential but um, sometimes it's not possible because of the, uh, the size of the patient. Then we looked at different uh, radiation uh, dose, uh, so 5, 10, and 20 milligray. Um, because um, we cannot deliver 20 milligray uh, using the fastest gantry revolution time, we had to adjust the gantry revolution time, meaning that uh, basically, if you want to try to, uh, uh, to use a 20 milligray dose, uh, we have to slow down the gantry revolution time to one second, which is 
basically not feasible for cardiac imaging, but we nevertheless use these uh, parameters in order to optimize uh, the CT protocol. Uh, then the voxel size with CT was 0 0.4, um, and we used different reconstruction algorithm. Uh, for the CMR sequence, for the uh, uh, MRI sequence, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it was basically a 2D radial uh, GRE uh, CNA. Uh, and then uh, we had a pixel resolution of uh, 0 0.6 millimeters. Um, so maybe I'm just going to move now quickly to the other paper, the first paper that we published in MRM, uh, just to show you how we uh, segmented those images. So we, um, yeah, here we can see it. So basically uh, the, the, the images were automatically segmented. Uh, we use a full width at half maximum approach where basically uh, each of those ray were uh, segmented with the full width at half max. And then we uh, computed the perimeter and the area of the, the coronary arteries. Um, then we basically um, measured, uh, so we, we know the, we, we know the, the area that we, we drilled, uh, and then basically we can quantify uh, the distribution of the measurements, so the, the, uh, the standard deviation defined the precision, and then the bias is you know, defined by the difference between the, the, the mean and the actual drilled area. So this is how we define accuracy and precision. And then we use as well the limit of detection. So if the two distribution don't overlap, then uh, by less than 95%, then we assume that we were able to distinguish between these two uh, diameters. So this is what we use to compare, to analyze the data. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. It's not too important. Uh, but then, so let's move to, to, uh, to the results. Uh, so here, maybe let me make it a bit smaller. So here we see some uh, images that um, we obtained with the optimization of the CT parameters. Um, so again, if we increase the iodine contrast, uh, of course, uh, we will get more uh, better contrast. So we expect to have more precise and accurate segmentation, uh, the same as if we increase the dose. Um, and as I said before, if we have a low uh, potential, so 100 uh, kVp instead of 100, uh, 120 kVp, as well, we get a better image quality. So just looking at these images and the segmentation, we see that this image here for uh, iodine 6%, uh, 100 kVp and 20 milligray uh, will give us the optimal uh, segmentation. And this observation was basically confirmed by looking at the distribution of the data. So here, on the x-axis, we have the diameter of the area of the hole that we, uh, we, we drilled. So we know the exact area on the y-axis. This is basically the area that we measured from the, uh, from the images. And again, so I will just jump quickly to the most optimum uh, measurement or protocol. So again, this is the same protocol as the one we looked before. This is the one that gives us the tightest uh, spread of the data. So the highest precision, which is what we are interested in. Um, this graph basically kind of summarized the, the graph that we've seen above. Um, so again, the accuracy and the precisions for the accuracy, so the closer to the zero, uh, the better. So we see that in general, CT was more precise than uh, MRI uh, for all the different uh, protocol that we used. Uh, but we see as well that we were less precise because I mean, we want to be as close as possible here. So we see that basically MRI uh, really outperformed in terms of precision uh, CT. Um, this is, um, well, I can move to the next one. Um, this is uh, not too important as well. I'm just going to move uh, now to the comparison between CT and MR. So uh, again, so the, the highest row, the top row here shows the optimized uh, CT protocol for different concentration. So the optimized protocol was basically the 20 milligray, 100 kVp, and ASIRB 90% for the reconstruction. And now if we compare these images with the CMR images, uh, we see that we get um, relatively good segmentation for both approaches. But now if you, uh, if you go ahead and quantify the precision and everything, um, here you can see right away that uh, the spread of the measurement with MR was much smaller than the spread with CT. Uh, and these graphs basically again summarize this, uh, this graph. Uh, and again, we see that uh, for almost every concentration of gadolinium that we've simulated, uh, we got much more precise, much more, uh, much more precise measurements than uh, with MRI than with CT, uh, which was actually very surprising to us. Uh, however, we see that by increasing the the iodine contrast, 
uh, the concentration of iodine, we get better, uh, more precise measurement, but uh, it seems that here we are reaching a plateau. So even if you are increasing the iodine contrast, uh, uh, we will probably not see a, a big improvement. Um, these results kind of summarize precision. That's what we've discussed before. Um, and one last thing that I want to, to add, um, we, we expect that uh, CT will usually outperform MR in terms of um, when we have motion. So we uh, simulated as well motion, we have a moving phantom. So we put that moving phantom in the MR and in CT, and then we uh, repeated the acquisition. And actually we saw that uh, with MR, we get um, still more precise measurement than with CT. This can be explained that because uh, with CT, when we take the highest gantry re revolution time, which is 200 uh, millisecond, so uh, the spatial resolution is half uh, or, uh, half rotation of the gantry revolution, so it's 108, 140 millisecond. Uh, we see that with 140 millisecond, we still have a lot of blurring that happens in the image. Um, but with MR, because we we require the data uh, only with, um, with the, using a segmented approach, we have a temporal resolution which is only of 40 milliseconds, so we get less blurring, motion blurring during that uh, acquisition window. Um, and yeah, this is basically uh, um, the main result. So, as I said, we were not expecting uh, MR to outperform uh, CT, so we got more precise measurement with MR than with CT. However, CT uh, uh, yielded more accurate measurements. Uh, and this is basically um, the main uh, result of our paper. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jérôme. Uh, we're a little bit over time and we'd usually try to stay very strict, but uh, just uh, very briefly to, to wrap up uh, the, the two papers. So I think Magnus and thank you, Marcus, for, for uh, answering the questions that came from the audience. They are on the chat. For those of you who didn't see that, go to the uh, chat window and then you can see there were questions from uh, Gavin and, and Vasil and Marcus answered them. So the takeaway was that image-based uh, navigation seems to perform very well in, uh, let's say, a complex group of patients in pediatric patients. So that is uh, certainly very encouraging. And uh, the most important question I had was about the uh, whether this is still proprietary to Philips, and apparently it is so. So let's hope that this would be uh, widely available soon so that uh, coronary angiography can be facilitated. And regarding the study from Lausanne, um, also uh, likewise, congratulations. I think it is also fantastic uh, work. And uh, the takeaway to me was that uh, in contrast to what many would expect, uh, Actually, the physical limits of CMR may not be uh, as, let's say, as, as weak as uh, compared to a CT as we thought. Um, a question I have, though, is um, the, let's say, MR or CT may have been uh, disadvantaged to a little extent, not only because of the gantry rotation time, but also the fact that you use basically straight holes, whereas in, 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 uh, in patients, of course, you, we have, may have curved vessels. So the, uh, the in-plane resolution, while it is very similar, the through-plane resolution is, of course, worse with, with uh, CMR because it's not uh, isotropic and that with a slice thickness of five, six millimeters. So do you think that would be a limitation in a clinical application when you would do the same comparison in, in uh, coronary arteries? Jerome, I think you're yeah, on so, mute. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, was, I was muted. Sorry, yeah. uh, can, you, can you repeat the question? Yes. yes. Um, so uh, the question was whether, because in CT you had an isotropic resolution, whereas in MR it was uh, not isotropic with a slice thickness of five, six millimeters. So do you think that would be in a clinical scenario where you have curved coronary arteries, would this be a limitation or would you expect similar results in clinical? Um, so I, actually it's not really true. We don't really have truly isotropic resolution with CT. Uh, we still have a, a thicker slice. And then another problem that we have with CT is that we cannot uh, do the acquisition perfectly perpendicular to the coronary artery, mm -hmm. and so this this is this is actually a problem. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Because the, the acquisition yeah. is strictly axial. So whereas with MRI we can always find a straight section of the coronary artery yeah. and then make sure that uh, the plane is perpendicular. But I agree that the yeah. okay. slice yeah. is much thicker. Yeah. 
Yeah, and uh, and just for for the others, it's, it, this was not so much about coronary angiography alone, but a kind of a dynamic angiography, looking at changes of the vessel diameter as an assessment of endothelial function. And so I find this uh, very interesting. Just a very small uh, confirmation. So you, the segmentation was always, or the evaluation was always automated, right? So this yes. was not a manual, uh, whatever. So that, that's just also important to know also that there's unlike the uh, bias. Thank you very much, both of you. If you could unshare your screen, uh, Jerome, Yes. And thanks uh, very much for joining. I uh, want to uh, just uh, before we close, and I'm sorry that we're five minutes late, I wanted to just briefly point to next uh, week's uh, uh, paper. So next week we'll uh, uh, put our eye on uh, strain. And uh, there is a paper from uh, a German uh, team on uh, strain of the right and the left ventricle especially in right ventricular disease. And we'll also discuss uh, a review also on strain that was published uh, by Bernard Gerber and his team. Uh, so uh, in two weeks from today, we'll meet again and uh, then the focus will be strain. I will probably add one other paper, uh, but you'll see that online and you can, as usual, you can download them. So thank you very much everybody for Zoran joining me despite the ISMRM. And thanks especially to, to Marcus and Jerome for uh, the beautiful presentation of their papers. And thanks for, for doing that great work. Uh, and uh, see you all next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.